welcome to All Things Policy, a daily podcast supported by Pragati, a flagship media initiative of the Takshashila Institution. We're a bunch of policy nerds based in Bengaluru, and we like to bring a fresh perspective to Indian affairs and an Indian perspective to global affairs. So grab a cup of coffee, sit back, and join us for today's chat. Hello and welcome to All Things Policy. In today's episode, I have Pranav Satyanath with me and we are going to be discussing India's new space policy which came out earlier this month. The government of India, if you recall, had unleashed reforms in the space sector starting from 2020. However, a clear regulatory framework was missing so far and this space policy intends to bridge that gap by giving more certainty to all the stakeholders involved. Pranav, let's begin this chat by recapping what has been happening till the release of this policy, right? So in the last couple of years, the space sector in India, especially the private space sector has been buzzing. So would you take us through the developments which led to the policy being formulated and released uh, this month? So we have to go as far back as 2017 to really understand where we were and where we have come today. In 2017, the union government put out a draft space activities bill and they tabled it and they could not even table it in the parliament. It was a draft. And the draft space activities bill essentially tried to introduce a regulatory mechanism through which you could get private players. Why would you need a regulatory mechanism in 2017? That's mostly because mostly throughout India's space history, ISRO maintained a monopoly over space activities. And for quite a long time, this was a very smart thing to do because only a government-backed agency had both the capital and had the political backing to take risks that no private entity could take. Your private companies did not have the capital to undertake build rockets or send satellites. At the same time, they, as private entities, they have a profit motive. They can't actually finance things for national prestige and sink in millions of dollars or crores of rupees to a finance project. So for quite a long time, it makes sense. But as technology evolved and as your your chips got more powerful, your electronics got smaller, private companies could build satellites and send them up and they could do all sorts of things and try to offer communication services and offer uh, imaging services and so on. But there was really no regulatory mechanism because for a very long time, the government thought we don't need one. And uh, in 2017, the concept of licensing was introduced. As soon as the word license was introduced, the private companies got quite wary especially with with things like penalties, with clauses that talked about penalties, they got quite wary and they said, this is a very deterring bill. And if this bill goes, it will really hurt uh, because you would have to wait months and years and so on to actually sort of get to do anything. And then the draft space activities bill eventually died in 2019 because the new parliament was formed and the bill was not reintroduced. And in 2019, after many, many years of effort from private institutions, including Takshashila. Uh, Takshashila, in fact, produced a, a, a draft, a new space activities bill. And after months of effort, in 2020, the government finally said that we will introduce a new mechanism through which private players can sort of come and join the government and carry out activities without much hindrance. And in 2021, they set up an organization called InSpace, Indian National Space Authorization Center. So this one was a regulatory body similar to what we had proposed, where we wanted an independent regulatory body that would look at all space activities. And in space has more or less turned out to be that. And this, the policy itself about what, how would in space function, what is its relationship with the Department of Space and what is its relationship with ISRO was quite unclear. And this space policy was kept quite secret. It was not circulated to an audience far and wide. So quite a small number of people, even within the space industry, were able to see this. Even the pioneers of the space industry were not able to sort of see this document. And so it was finally released. So this is a very long story. We came from no regulation to quite a bad set of guidelines that would regulate the space sector. And finally, we have something where we have reached a baseline where we can say that this is very satisfactory and we can build from here. Right. And uh, like you mentioned, beginning from India's space program, as far as one can recall, ISRO has held this way. It is essentially a monopoly or it was until the last couple of years when that changed. And this space policy, I think, solidifies that position because it creates four different entities with different roles, responsibilities and functions. First, you have in space, which acts as an authority, which regulates space activities by private and non-private actors. Then you have ISRO, which will be a purely research organization. We'll talk more about it later. And then uh, we have NSIL, which is a public sector unit, which will carry out the commercial activities from the government side. And finally, you have the Department of Space, which is the nodal agency for implementing this policy and 
has uh, like the ultimate authority in matters of interpretation of this policy and so on. So it clearly delineates the functions across these uh, four different stakeholders. Uh, but to take a step back before we get into the nitty gritties of the policies, I wanted to get your thoughts on this aspect, right? This policy essentially provides an authorization framework for uh, private entities to engage in space activities. It is not exactly a vision document for the country. What do you think about this? Do you think uh, we are missing something? Do you think maybe this is going to change over time? So what is your take on it? So this is a very inward looking policy. So when, when, when people essentially in the space sector read about policy, we think about broad national priorities. Uh, for example, the 2020 United States space policy was encompassing a lot of things, commercial policy, military policy, and their approach to the moon, their approach to uh, going to Mars and recovering Mars resources. And it covered a lot of things, right? And this was an outward looking policy. And similarly, I was quite fascinated that there's another document called 2023 Space Policy. This is actually by Switzerland. So Switzerland also has a 2023 Space Policy. And this Space Policy is also quite outward looking. They talk about the priorities and they talk about how they want to collaborate with other countries. And they talk about how their departments would implement these goals. So those are all vision documents. Those are all roadmaps. But ISROS is really, it's, it's an inward space policy. It's a space policy for India rather than India's space policy. So in that sense, this space policy for India does not actually shy away from saying that this is mostly to define how we think about commercial activities in India. And the vision really says that they want to augment India's space capabilities by allowing the commercial sector to thrive and cherish. So whoever wrote this document, and we will talk about it a little later, it's quite clear that this is a vision document for India rather than India's vision document. So that's quite clear. And this is really what we expected. But like I said, what funny is that we don't know who wrote this document. We know that it made circles within the government. And of course, it originated probably also had a big role in ISRO. And of course, the document was published on the ISRO website. Yeah. But we don't know who published the document. If you look at the document, if you read it, it reads like somebody took a Word document, added page numbers, and just started typing in Times New Roman, right? And so yeah, unlike unlike most government documents where you have the government emblem, where you know which yeah. ministry it came from, it's not clear where it came from, whether it's the Department of Space or whether it's the Space Commission. The Space Commission is under the Prime Minister's office, which is supposed to take all the vision, all, all these vision statements. It's supposed to make roadmaps and so on. But Space Commission, for example, is not even mentioned in this document, quite surprisingly. So we don't know who wrote this document or, or, or you know, who is actually in charge of this, but we believe it's the Department of Space. And uh, it's quite interesting that I'm sure that at some point we will get a space strategy. A lot of people contemplate that we will have a national space strategy. The Air Forces, the Indian Air Force also envisions that we will eventually have a national space strategy. So this document is quite good for what we expected and for the goals that it sets for itself. I think it has stuck to those boundaries. Right. And a small follow up there, actually. So when you speak of a national space strategy, do you think that will delineate what India's military goals in space are and what India's scientific exploration goals in space are? And this is going to come in the future while the present policy is just authorization framework for private space activities. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, definitely. In the future, we will get a, a space policy where they, they will talk about security and exploration and science. For a very long time, the Department of Space and the Space Commission really stayed away from the military aspect of it. This is mostly because they wanted to, especially during sensitive time after our 1998 nuclear tests, ISRO was under immense scrutiny because uh, they did not want to see a space agency, a, a civilian space agency, contribute to military programs. Uh, so for at least from 1995 onwards, or, or 1990s onwards, they made quite a strenuous effort to isolate military space, space activities from civilian space activities. I think now it's a reality that our country has to look at safety, security, and science more holistically. So a national space strategy should address all of those three in tandem. Right. Now let's jump into the policy, right? So let's talk about the hits and misses in the policy. And as far as I understand by looking at it, there are quite a lot of positives. Non-government entities or the private players are allowed to participate in the entire space supply chain ecosystem. The government has mandated that ISRO will share remote sensing data on a free and open source basis with some exceptions. In fact, there is an active push for ISRO to transfer technology to commercial players on a free, fair and open and equitable basis. So if you were to list out a few of these prominent hits that this policy encompasses, what would those be? 
So first of all, it's the definitions. I think the definitions are really important. They get the definitions spot on and they, they make sure that they don't convolute different activities. For example, if you're a company that does space data processing, you really don't have to go through the, the, the regulation, right? A space company can sell you data and you can just process data with your software and you can do whatever you want with it. So that's a good thing. They are differentiating what exactly space activities are. And this mostly includes space operations, including ground operations, right? Ground operations meaning having tracking stations, having your own radars. So uh, I really like the definitions, particularly the definition of what constitutes space activities. They've also described orbital resources very well, which is to either claim a specific points uh, in geostationary orbit or have spectrum, right? Uh, gain access to a variety of spec through the International Telecommunications Union. So the definitions is definitely a very, very good start. And carrying forward from the definition, when you look at what the non-government entities, which basically means the, the, the commercial private sector can do, it encompasses quite a large number of activities, including things like you don't have to own your own satellite for having communication or imagery activities. You can lease a satellite. Uh, you can tell somebody else to manufacture outside India to build a satellite for you and you, you can be the operator of the satellite. So those are quite really good. And finally, of course, I think people who watch this very closely, especially space governance part, is that non-government entities are allowed to recover asteroid resources or space resources. Yeah. And they're, they're allowed to possess, own, transport, use and sell yeah. these resources. This is quite important for us because for a very long time, India did not articulate its position on what it thinks about space mining. What we're talking here about is space mining. Space mining is quite contentious because, especially on the moon, because if you're operating, let's say, extracting the silica sand in space or you're extracting water on the moon, do you own the perimeter where you're mining? So these were questions that have not been solved. But there's a question about what does it mean to have ownership? If you simply take samples or if you simply extract material and you leave the territory as is or you leave the ground surface as is, is that considered to be a national appropriation of territory? Yeah. And the Indian government thinks no. And this is a very subtle way of acknowledging that the Indian government's position is that it is very, very much forward-looking and, and positive about uh, space mining and space resource collection. So these are some of the hits that I saw on the NGE side on the in-space side, one of the major concerns for the, for the industry and for policy watchers was trying to understand what is in-space's role? What will it take? You know, how can in-space be a regulator as well as a promoter? Because if you look at the way they came out, they said, we will do handholding of the space companies, we will promote them, and so on. But we did not know this. How can you regulate the same industry that you're also trying to promote, right? And in the document, and some, would, some might disagree with me here, but in the document, I think, first and foremost, it establishes in space as a regulatory authority. The very first paragraph that addresses in the role of InSpace says, quote, act as a single window agency for authorization of space activities by government entities as well as NGEs, uh, close quote. So uh, first and foremost, it's a regulatory entity. And on the promotion side, it has said promote industries, cluster manufacturing hubs and so on, which basically means that in space will say we are doing an excellent job having this regulatory mechanism. Please come and be a part of it. There, somebody is establishing a research hub. Please join that. We will provide regulatory licensing and we will provide uh, regulatory incentives to, for you to join. So these are ways that they can promote. But uh, definitely, if you just read through the entire section of the role of in space, then you definitely see that it is a regulator first and then a promoter second. I was quite happy about that. And uh, on the smaller side, I think InSpace is also taking a little too much on itself where it says it will issue guidelines on safety, on debris yeah. mitigation, and resolve disputes about liability. These are quite good, but it's for an age for a very new agency that has secured just over one crore of funding it is quite ambitious uh, what it wants to do. So, but it, it looks good and, and what we would eventually want to see is how it's implemented. And ISRO finally, as you mentioned, uh, ISRO eventually wants to uh, transition from a manufacturer of uh, launch vehicles to a, a more or less a high technology research agency and uh, science agency. So these are really some of the points that are really, really good and they are quite satisfactory. 
Right. And I'm happy that you pointed out the aspect about uh, India taking a stance on space mining by making it clear that whoever uh, brings back the space resource or asteroid resource can claim ownership over it. And this includes private players. But the other contentious issue as far as, you know, the international regime on space law has been concerned is also of liability. And uh, I think you mentioned that, you know, this policy sort of skips over that question by saying that in space will prescribe guidelines to address liability aspects arising out of potential damages due to space activities. So that is another sticky point which has um, not been covered so far. Of course, in space uh, might issue guidelines which clarify the position more in the coming days. But if you were to talk about some of the drawbacks from this policy, if you were to mention what are the misses uh, according to you, uh, what would those be? I think the first miss, and I, th- I think uh, you might be uh, in, a, in a better position to articulate this, is that what is a legal basis for establishing a regulatory authority? Okay. Now, this is an authority that is essentially going to be a gatekeeper for uh, private entities, right? It, it could also be a gatekeeper for other government entities. Mm-hmm. So uh, as a gatekeeper and as, a, as an entity that issues government licenses what is the legal basis for its establishment what is the structure of its establishment is it laid down by law and this matters not only for domestic policy but also international policy because your international treaty like the outer space treaty heavily hinge on national legislation uh, they demand that especially li- the the liability convention and the registry convention call for national legislation so that you can regulate activities in your own country after all by international treaties a state, irrespective of whether it's a private player or a public entity, is the state itself is responsible. Whatever happens within the state is the responsibility of the state. So if a private company does, does something bad in space, it's not a private company who's liable. It's India that's liable. It's India as a state that's liable. So for in space to have to take up that onus of responsibility, it needs a parliamentary assurance. It needs that legal backing. And without that legal mandate, it's difficult to see. It's not that you don't need it. They could, they could definitely operate as a regulator without a legal mandate, right? But but, but really, to have that legal mandate, you, sol- you solidify the structure and future governments cannot put it down. You know, if you don't have it laid by, if you don't have it put down by law, a future government can come and say, I'm going to dismantle this entire structure because nothing in the established legal act, no single act tells me what to do. So I don't even have to go for an amendment. I can just scrap the entire deal altogether. So to secure in space's position, you need it to become a new space policy bill. And this bill will have to be passed by parliament through an act. Something like what happened to TRAI, the Telecom Regulatory Authority of India, uh, that was established through an act in 1997. So one of the one of the scarier bits is why isn't this why isn't this legally mandated? Why isn't this given a legal status? So that's one. Uh, what do you think about it? Because I'm not a trained lawyer, and thinking about all the drawbacks based on what I've read from treaties. But as a lawyer, what do you think about a regulatory body with yeah. that is not established by law? No, I'm broadly in agreement with whatever you said, but it is also a matter of timing. So we have had instances in the past with a couple of reg- regulators uh, where they were actually set up first by executive notification, much like in space. So when SEBI, which regulates your stock markets, it was first set up as authority by executive notification and not by law. The SEBI Act was passed by parliament a couple of years later. And same with the UIDAI, which is your unique identification authority of uh, India, which was also set up by a cabinet uh, resolution and not by law and it was granted statutory status much later and UIDI functions as a regulator for your uh, Aadhaar data right so I mean we have such uh, instances in the past so the hope is and for the reasons that you mentioned it is very important that uh, in space gets statutory recognition very soon and this will also ensure the independence of regulator because right now it is subordinate to a government department and much of what it does is subject to the uh, decisions of the master sitting in the department of space right and even if you look at the last line in this policy it says uh, notwithstanding anything contained in this policy the government reserves its right to provide exemptions to the provisions contained here in on a case to case basis which means they have that backdoor option to subvert everything that uh, they have put into this policy and for, even from a business continuity perspective it is important that uh, you give uh, a uh, legal basis to this regime of authorization by in space that this policy proposes because businesses would be much more reassured of their position and continuity because it's backed by law and it's not by a policy which can be withdrawn or tomorrow if the government so wishes so yeah but uh, since like i mentioned there have been instances where you know statutory recognition has come Soon afterwards, if not uh, at the time of creation of an agency, we can hope and expect uh, that this will be granted to InSpace in the coming years. 
Stay tuned to All Things Policy. We'll be right back after a short commercial break. But precisely, uh, what I like is you mentioned uh, the departments of space as the master, yeah. and uh, that is the third sort of sort of fallback or, or sort of shortcoming of this policy. That is, they don't really go broadly enough to talk about the structure of in space and how independent it is from the department of space. Yeah. There are three instances where they mention the phrase level playing field, and the level playing field is extremely important because for. For the main concern of uh, the private industry, especially the smaller companies, was that we can never compete against ISRO. ISRO is never going to allow us to have a level playing field. And the problem here is the chairman of ISRO is also the secretary to the Department of Space, right? Yeah. So the person here is person here who is the who becomes the chairperson of ISRO essentially rises from the ranks of ISRO's scientists and engineers. So once they rise up the ranks, they hold that chairman position. And then they're not IAS officers, right? And they eventually get appointed as secretaries of the department of as the secretary of the Department of Space. Now, if you have the chairman and the secretary as the same as the same person, but you have the chairman of in space as a different person, the master of the chairperson of in space is still the chairperson of ISRO and, 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 and the, the secretary of the Department of Space. So that independence is still not there. And, and I question the independence on two separate sort of causalities. The first is what I just mentioned about sharing the same secretariat and, and you know having the same secretary and having this overarching Department of Space. And the second is about how ISRO will transition itself. Now, if you remember, this company called New Space India Limited, NSIR, now, NSIL is an independent body. Is Now, it's a commercial arm of the Department of Space. If you remember, the predecessor to New Space India Limited was this company called Antrix Private Limited. And Antrix had a very slow death. And now Antrix is, does not do any of these commercial operations. New Space India Limited essentially operates ISRO launch vehicles. They operate the PSLV, they operate the small satellite launch vehicle SSLV, and they operate the bigger rockets. And these are built by ISRO. The engines are built by ISRO. So what I'm concerned about, and, and the policy doesn't really have to address this, but what I'm concerned about is to what extent will these technologies that are essentially engineered by ISRO, uh, how much of that will actually simply go to New Space India Limited and, and what monopoly will that still retain or what competitive advantage will New Space India Limited uh, retain because of its proximity to ISRO, right? And this is one of my more basic concerns. And how will procurement happen? Now, if launches are supposed to happen on a market basis, then then in space really because it hold in new space India Limited because it holds all the key technologies, does it mean that it and it's also it's a government entity? Does it mean that it will have the authority? It will have the sole monopoly over government payload launches. The Ministry of Agriculture wants to launch it, so will they go only to NSIL? So these are some concerns that I have, and 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 what I really wish is that in space was a completely separate entity under the Space Commission. Uh, of course, the Space Commission being the other one is, even though it's 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 a supreme policy making body, uh, it's not mentioned even a single time. And I guess the Space Commission is really a null body. Most of the power is held within the Department of Space. Uh, so those are some of the shortfalls that I see. And and finally, many of the people in the industry and in within this row and people within the Department of Space say that a separate document that sort of flushes out the issue of foreign direct investment. If in space and the Department of Space want to attract foreign companies to India and say India has a good regulatory mechanism, you should participate in our in our country, then what is FDI? We believe that FDI will be addressed in a separate document, but if it were addressed in this document, it would have made it a lot more holistic and a lot more reassuring for companies because a lot of Indian companies aren't actually Indian. They are incorporated abroad and they also have a branch in, in India and the transfer of funds happens where uh, that foreign company invests in the domestic company and, and, and you have that structure where you're allowing with the flow of funds to be much easier. Uh, so those are some concerns that uh, we wish they were addressed, but hopefully they will be addressed in a separate document. 
Yeah, on FDI, but at least I wouldn't worry too much about this policy not touching upon it because I think that's a separately regulated policy altogether. Because you'll have your uh, Department of uh, Promotion of Industrial Trade. I think they are the nodal agency when it comes to the mm-hmm. FDI policy in the country. So you might expect amendments in the future if the government is. Uh, keen on allowing FDI in the space sector as well, which should be the case because uh, even in this policy, the definition of a non-government entity uh, is any company which is incorporated in India. So it does not really say any company which is controlled uh, or operated by Indians or something like that, right? So it is fairly flexible. So I think once you get the green signal from the commerce ministry guys who control the FDI policy, that should also go through. But uh, finally, I wanted to speak a little bit more about the ISRO transition that you touched upon, right? So this is a major overhaul of ISRO. So essentially, there are two ways of looking at it. More cynical version would be that, uh, you know, ISRO is being cutted. Uh, essentially, uh, all that they have worked on so far is being made available for free. Uh, assets are being uh, moved out. And uh, maybe if the separation of the chairman ISRO and uh, Department of Space Secretary role happens, as it should, uh, then uh, ISRO is a far more powerless organization. So in that sense, that's a cynical view, as I mentioned. But a more positive view is we have reached a stage in our space program where ISRO can and transition into a purely research and development oriented institution and you can leave commercial activities to both PSUs like NSIL or the private space sector. But this transition process itself I expect is going to be very difficult because there's not much clarity on it. Does it mean the ownership of all the PSLV systems and you know the uh, ground facilities that ISRO owns and controls today is going to be shifted? I think this is going to be a very tough process. So what are your thoughts on this achieving this sort of restructuring of ISRO? So one of the interesting things is, um, I think ISRO facilities themselves, the test facilities and the engine test stands and all of them, the launch pads, I think they will be addressed as a department of space premises. Uh, so that is well addressed uh, within the role of in space. So in space will uh, make sure that they will provide a level playing field to enable access to you know DOS facilities, and they will also allow uh, private entities to set up specialized f- facilities within DOS premises. Right. This is a very close reminder of what NASA did quite early on, where they allowed private companies to come and refurbish even landmark space launch pads like the Apollo launch pad uh, in Cape. Canaveral in Florida. The was actually where they launched Apollo 11 and now it's being used by SpaceX. So these are quite things where I, I don't think that's a problem. I think the transition ISRO will, will, will hopefully see this as a good thing for them because it will save them up so much money because so much of the budget was only going for manufacturing, right? And we hope that it will save up so much money for ISRO to become that sciencey organization again. If you remember 1970s, 1980s, it was a very, I mean, of course, they were manufacturing, uh, they, they were trying to procure engines, they were trying to do all these things with, with rockets. And at that time, it was a very sciencey thing because they were experimenting with new technology. And eventually, ISRO will become sort of that thing again, right? But they're doing much more advanced things like building the human space flight capsule, mm-hmm. building a rovers that can go to Mars after Mangalyaan probe, we did not have anything. So they aim for sending probe missions to Mars and so on without really worrying about, oh, we have to build a launch vehicle. They can have so much more money saved. But of course, it will also mean that during the transition phase, they will lose quite a bit of money because some of that money will have to be redirected to in space as a regulatory body and money will have to go to New Space India Limited. And some people actually say that New Space India Limited will become a major, it will become more important than ISRO because they will start building, you know, a lot of government payloads also. So it will be, be a constructor. So it will be interesting to see. But this takes me back to that NASA debate in back in the 2000s where the traditional sort of gatekeepers of the big companies and, and NASA were very, very skeptical of having a private sector because it was the same attitude, right? You know, these are people, these are students, you know, these are 21-year-old, 23-year-old engineers uh, who, who are nurtured within ISRO and they rise up the ranks over many, many years and they're within the bureaucracy and they're within the scientific bureaucracy and they're very trusted. So it's like almost kinship, right? And how do you give up on that? And how do you trust some person who studied in a private college who's probably studied, <laughs> who's probably done an MBA and he's running a company and he, he or she is telling you to launch rockets. It's, it's a culture change. I think ISRO will definitely have to get used to. It will be a difficult few 
years during the phase of transition but hopefully it will be a positive thing and and definitely it is a positive thing if you do the math if you do the cost the, the opportunity cost what isro has taken off all these years uh, it's definitely a benefit for isro i think isro will itself see it in a positive light right thank you so much for joining uh, me on in this discussion today on india's uh, new space policy just to sum up i think the major expectations going ahead is of course uh, what is india's national space strategy going to look like the clarification on uh, fdi that uh, we expect uh, to be coming very soon and the uh, overall uh, restructuring of isro from whatever it is doing today to a purely research uh, based organization and the growth and development of india space sector which already in the last uh, few years has picked up space yeah. picked up pace uh, so anyway thank you pranav so for joining me yeah thank you shri we will of course do many many more podcasts on this we've been waiting this for over a year we you and i have done at least a couple of podcasts where we lament the absence of a, of a new space policy so we will talk much much more about this uh, we will elaborate on maybe we will have one entire episode on one single paragraph of the new space policy but this has been very fun i really enjoyed doing this podcast with you thank you if you liked our show don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the ivm network you can tune into them on the ivm podcast app ivmpodcast.com or wherever you listen to your podcasts you can also follow ivm on social media the handle is at ivm podcasts on twitter facebook and instagram and hey If you'd like to dive into Takshashila's research on technology, strategy and economic affairs, check us out at our Twitter handle at takshashila.inst or our website takshashila.org.in.